Okay, guys, I am delighted to welcome back um, a very good friend of mine. The way that um, the world uh, is such today, uh, we don't speak a hell of a great deal. But you know what? Um, whenever I reach out to our guest today, um, we always just love to have a good chat. And this is going to mm -hmm. benefit you all. And I just want to say, Joe, welcome back. Good to speak Glad to you. Glad to be again. here, man. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I can't. Like mentioned before, because I, we just we get the. I don't actually care about anybody listening. No, I'm no, just, no. Exactly. I'm just happy to be here. Take that, you guys. Well, listen, guys. For those of you who do not know, um, I'm going to let Joe do a little bit of an introduction. But we go back years, years, um, right back when Ben uh, Pogolski opened up MI40 Gym. Even before that, we knew, we knew each other. Um, somebody I've got a lot of respect for, and somebody in the fitness industry. If you don't know, um, aka the hypertrophy coach, and uh, you. you Incredible brand and everything that you do, but just to give everybody a little bit of bit of a background, it's been a well. We we spoke during lockdown the last time on the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, we filled a bit of bit of our own time <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. chatting then, but just for the benefit of this episode um, and to give you the ability to just let everybody know, kind of like a bit about your background and where you are now. Sure. So that yeah. would just help, just to give some yep. context. Yeah, I'll try and keep this short. I don't know how short to ever keep it. But um, honestly, that's why I like chatting with you as well, because we share a lot of uh, commonalities, I think, obviously, with our our, uh, our pedigree, our heritage coming up in the in the industry. But honestly, I, I, I can relate on so many levels to so many people, which is why I like this whole muscle building thing, because I started like just literally like an obsessed person, 15 years old. I remember reading my brother. Uh, he had uh, Arnold's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. And I would steal it from him whenever I could and just like pour over that. I was like, holy, it was like one of those things where something like clicked. I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember I loved reading about him, how he talked about exercise and things like that. And so I literally became obsessed. Like my entire family legit thought I had mental problems. Um, where at my last two years of high school here, um, I was working out three times a day. I would literally work out during school, after school. I'd go to my job. I would pay for a gym membership. After my job, I'd go work out again. I had no idea about recovery or nutrition, but I was just, I was literally obsessed with training. I just liked training. I would literally take like, uh, if my dad would allow me on family vacations, I'd take like dumbbells and stuff. My dad's like, my my dad and I have a great relationship, but he would literally be the guy that would just like give me so much crap. We would just butt heads just out of the sheer principle. And so I'd be like, I, he's like, I gotta bring 50 pounds of damn dumbbells in this car going on vacation or whatever. And I'm like, what is it? Are we really weighing down the car? Is that really the issue here? Um, but anyway, I start, I could go on, I, I could write a book, maybe I will at some point in time, just for me to read it if no one else, but about all of my, um, just obsessive love with training from high school through college, um, through doing the same thing that everybody does now in a different form, just scraping for every bit of knowledge I could get reading magazines were huge then. So I literally would have multiple subscriptions to magazines, reading forums, watching YouTube and its infancy of everything. Um, so I, I really say, I, you know, I, I relate to a lot of people on the level of just being obsessed with this. It was honestly at that point in time, my age was like one of my defining characteristics of anybody that knew me knew I was like, Hey, it's a guy that's crazy with working out. Um, you know, then I got my degree in exercise science, kind of figuring stuff out, had no idea what I wanted to do with that. Just felt like I needed a grown up job. And if I could get something in college that had the word exercise in it, I was like, all right, it seems like a good, good a place to start as any, I got a job in corporate wellness right out of school because I literally, the same thought process, it went, went nowhere beyond um, corporate and wellness. And I was like, well, corporate sounds like a grown up thing to do. And wellness, something like I want to do Uh great experience for learning that that's not what I wanted to do at all. Got introduced to someone that worked for what, like a, a like a big box, um, you know, uh, a gym uh, company. So similar to like a lifetime, um, or a 24 hour fitness or something like that. And uh, honestly, got that was a huge pivotal point for me because it was the first time I actually had they. It was a medium sized company, so I, I believe at its peak maybe had 60, 70 clubs, but a, you know, pretty big company. And they had a brilliant personal training department. They modeled a lot after the Lifetime model, and so that was really the first time I got exposed to like, oh my gosh, there's like professionals. I literally, the you know, I already always trained at bodybuilding gyms, so all the trainers that I knew were like guys wearing like stringers, you know, with like a fanny pack, like their nipples hanging out while they're training clients and like drinking protein. And I was like, I know, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. That's not a a personal trainer is not a real job because that was my image of a personal trainer. Uh, and honestly, it was crucial. It was like, and not just that I get in a good company, but I had a very good manager and mentor at that point in time, his manager that ended up being the president of personal training, then the president of the company at some point in time was very close with him. So I got really close with people that were just brilliant fitness professionals. Um, and so that I spent the next, you know, I, literally I was a trainer maybe for only 
18 months um, and then uh, took into a management position at the club, had a very big club in the company. Um, so I, that whole experience I could write about those 10 years of just the business, grinding the business, myself being in the club, like legit 80 hours a week, like nonsense stuff. I would literally open the club, always had a client at 5 or 5.30 a.m., um, and literally wouldn't leave. My wife would come from her normal job while I was still working. I'd train clients while she was there. I wouldn't leave till seven, eight o'clock at night. And that was just my life for you know five days a week. I'd work half days on Saturdays and um, just the business. That was my whole, my whole thing. Um, and then at some point in time in the middle there, I transitioned really to like, I always wanted to be better. And it was after a couple of years of realizing, like I went through all the education my company had and um, was like, man, I need, I need more. And I was bugging that guy that was the president of personal training, brilliant guy, and he literally, I remember the conversation said to me, I'm talking to him on the phone. I'm asking him a bunch of questions still about, I don't even know what the heck we were talking about. And he literally was like, bro, he's like, I, I can't, I can't have these calls with you every day. He's like, I, I got a job to do. And he, I'm like, he wasn't being mean about it. I was like, oh, that makes sense. It's kind of an important job. And I was like, well, I want to learn more. What do I do? He's like, dude, go take some certs, go get some seminars or whatever. And I was like, oh yeah, that's a thing. And he was actually close friends with Charles Paulquin. So that's how I got connected with Paulquin in the first place, just going and doing his courses. So um, you know, I had a transition there where I've still to this day, that was, I believe in 2009, I took my first Paulcom course. Um, and I've taken some sort of continuing education every single year, most of the time, twice a year since then. So, uh, Paulcom definitely had the, the biggest spur resistance training specialists has by far had the biggest impact. Um, but I've done MAT, um, you know, functional range conditioning. I've done some weird stuff, some WEC stuff, some USAW, NASM, whatever. I mean, I don't remember half the stuff that I've gone through and done. Um, and in that whole time as well, too, like you said, I really kind of got, I always loved working with meatheads and bodybuilders and my, my niche was no one told me, everyone told me it was a bad idea. But when I was working just as a normal guy in the gym is I always wanted to train the biggest guys. I always liked training that. And I always felt like I can, I can do this because what they lack in, you know, knowledge because of their genetics, I can fill the gap, but I also understand the whole meathead mentality. So it's not whatever. And everybody said, don't do that because they have, they have no money. And that's a small demographic stick with weight loss or whatever. I was like, I like doing that. And it was like, through that time, I started working with more bodybuilders. I connected with our you know mutual friend, Ben Pikulski. And that was really kind of an intro where I started. I was so passionate about working with bodybuilders and people that just wanted to be huge. I started to build you know a demographic for that. And, um, and I tell people all the time, I didn't start social media until 2015, I believe. Um, or 16, which is, you know, that was at that point in time, you know, 10 full years into my professional career. And, um, you know, and that's when people started to have some idea of who I am and what I do. And I just started posting about, you know, at that point in time, I was working with Ben uh, at MI40. It was one of the two trainers that helped start that with him. And, um, and honestly, just that's where I think most people, if you're familiar with me, kind of picked up from there. I've been lucky enough to work with um, legitimately some of the best bodybuilders in the world um, for the past, like I said, decade or so. And, uh, so that kind of, that catches us up. I got a, I have a, I have just a, a love for every level of the industry from being a huge, like if you could get a PhD and being a meathead, I'd have like a double PhD in meatheadness. <laughs> um, I love everything about the industry. Like I love the training side of the industry, which I know that obviously you, like when, when you've been in it, like obviously you even know what levels that I don't, but you know what it's like to be that trainer working 60, 70 hours a week. You know what it's like to be over a club and build a team of trainers you know, it's like to be like so focused on the business part. And obviously that's still, that's the massive part of your business. Um, and I, so like I've every little level along the way from just meathead, to the business part to working with high level athletes and, you know, kind of everything in between. Like, I just, I love, I love all of it. I have a passion for all those different things. And, um, and, and I'm grateful for all those different levels. Cause again, for people watching it, if I feel like I always joke, I'm not like the smartest person ever. And there's people that could rattle off studies and explain in chemistry much deeper than I could, but I have a pretty good, you know, I've, I can relate to so many people at so many different levels because I mean, I've, I've been, I've been there. That's, that's the only thing I've done obviously since I was a kid, basically. So that's, uh, that's my bio. Good, good well, podcast. Maybe see you next time. <laughs> good to meet you, right? It's nice to have you back. Yeah, the, bio, yeah. the bio podcast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Um, 
you know, and I think people, anybody watching this on YouTube will probably say, did you guys get the memo with these headphones? And uh, yes. we, we had a little bit of a laugh afterwards uh, because we were talking about kind of like the, the, the ear pods versus these are our staples. And this is kind of yeah. like, this is OG headphones here. So I was just laughing yeah. a little bit. <laughs> this is the, ma- this is the master's division. <laughs> yeah, headphones. <laughs> it was just funny that we both had them on at the same time. Now, look, one of the things that I was actually going to ask you a little bit later on to the podcast, but I'll ask you now. And then for those of you, you know, watching or listening, we're going to delve into the some training stuff because this is what Joe eats, sleeps and breathes. And I, I also want to hear it as well. Mm-hmm. But you've talked about and something that is that is raised a lot. Been in the industry a couple of years, desperate to work with top level people. Mm-hmm. You've been in the industry a long time. You go on your YouTube. You've got, you know, you friends with Dana and you know and all these top level athletes you've worked with flex and all these top people to any trainer that's like I, I want to be like Joe I want to be getting to train these people I want to be in the in the company of these people there's a lot of I think a lot of people feel entitled within an early stage of their career to be working with top level people and yeah. there's no there's no degree of not necessarily I'd say 100 patience but I'd just love to know right at the beginning of this episode, because you have talked about, I've been able and fortunate enough to work with all these meatheads. It's Mm -hmm. not been a five minute journey to anybody that's wanting to work with this top echelon of the fitness industry. Yeah. What would your advice be? Um, You know, I mean, so honestly, I feel like it's a joke, but I, you know, I figured out kind of early on that I don't have the best genetics in the universe. Like it was like from in high school, like I would train, I would lead the workouts of all my friends. And I'd be like, why is everyone getting bigger and stronger faster than me? Same thing in college. Same thing when I'm working. Obviously, my first group of trainers that I worked with, most of them are just genetic freaks, right? Most, lots, not most of them, lots of trainers get into training because they have big biceps and they've been hearing it their whole life. And somebody finally says, all right, well, I might as well get paid to answer how do I got big biceps. And um, so anyway, I honestly say a lot of it comes from the fact that I, I had to think more. <laughs> Than someone maybe that it just had it handed to them easily. Um, and so honestly, it's me thinking more and just me casually helping people. And then when I actually started working with normal people, I mean, there's there's obviously a gap at first to figure out. I obviously there's a difference between me at 20, you know, or 22 compared to 45 year old normal, whatever. But for everybody that I worked with, like I, I could relate with them a lot more because none of it came easy to me. So even with my own, aside from certifications and you know, initial education that really didn't help that much. I, I really had a genuine belief in that because I had to figure out things a little bit more um, and I, I had to learn concepts more. I actually had a foundation where I truly believed in myself that I could help anyone, period, because I was like, well, I'm not I'm not meant to be big and I'm still continuing to grow and get big. I'd be at a slower pace than most people. So honestly, that was like the number one thing is like because now I, you know, like you said, it's so everything's so superficial and everyone just says like someone's like everyone just sees the end result and they just say, I want that. And then it's like. You know, if, uh, I always think like, yeah, it's nice to work with these people, but you j- legitimately think you have something to offer them outside of that. I want to work with them. Neat. Like, what? why would they want to work with you? Um, so honestly, it's core was just like a genuine, true belief that I can help anyone, especially people that are getting to that point of diminishing returns. I guess that's why I like, you know, bodybuilders so much to a certain degree is because they do the same thing as everyone else. I mean, their ceiling is so much higher, you know, so you'll have these people that are competitive pro bodybuilders and genetic freaks can be competing within, you know, six or eight years of starting to train, which is nuts. But then they have the same issues that everyone else, you know, things plateau. And if they have, they're the genetic elite for a lot of reasons, they got there so easy that they're like, holy crap, like, well, why are the same things that work so well for so long not working now? And I felt like I could fill those gaps. And then honestly, before anyone had any idea who I was, like I said, I had a passion for working with the people in the gym that no one else wanted to work with. Cause you, you know how it is. Like if you just see like a huge guy in the corner in the gym, everyone's like, that's the guy that knows what he's doing. I'm not going to talk to him because look, he's bigger than everybody. He has to know more than what he is. So I always say to a trainer, like if you're not comfortable approaching and offering something to the biggest guy in your gym, like why would you ever think you deserve to work with the biggest guy in your country or in the world, right? Like that's the whole idea. And that's everyone say, I want to see, I want to work with this end result person. Without, like, with, without, with, with, and they're trying to bypass that middle bit. Yeah. And it's honestly, it's the same thing. It's like, they, literally, you're just saying, I mean, it, within our industry, these people are famous. And it's like, are you actually like, I don't, I never wanted to be like a celebrity trainer or something. I just want to work with the best of the best or whatever. And then at the highest level of bodybuilding, that ends up being people <clears throat> within our tiny industry that are, are famous within our industry. Um, but it's like, that's, that's the test, right? Because all the things that go into, like, literally, obviously, you know, tra- you're a trainer, you're on the floor, you're in a gym. 
get to the place where you feel like you have something legitimately so you can comfortably talk to the biggest guy in the gym and turn that person into a client. And, and once you've done that, I don't think there's really necessarily a limit of who you can work with at that point in time, because that's what I would do. I was literally people like, I remember like legit some of my first like huge clients training some guys at the national level or whatever. And I would literally have normal people like you're training him, like these guys that are 50 pounds bigger and leaner than me. I'm like, yeah, I'm training him. Shut up. I know I'm small. And, um, but you know, that's obviously I'm, I'm a trainer, not, not supposed to be a bodybuilding competitor. So, and then from there, honestly, things just tend to tend to snowball. And honestly, then there's the only little missing piece from there is when people actually, you know, what we, is I guess implementation is probably the best word, which everybody skips now in our industry. Everybody likes to read about it, take a course about it. You know, everyone's got somebody that's going to 10x your business and do all this kind of stuff. All that stuff, which some of it might be great. There's a whole lot of truth to it. There's a lot of people that actually can improve everybody. The thing that I don't think people cover enough is like, well, where is this part where there is an actual action requirement that goes on you? You know, the trainer, the individual. Because there were a billion times where, like, when I was, I literally remember, like, I have key, like, bunch of key times with the first times I worked with individuals or whatever, where the biggest thing was me actually going and in initiating conversation or me going and reaching out to get the contact of someone or me getting outside of my comfort zone to make something happen. And for every single person that someone's like, Oh, how'd you work with them? How'd you work with them? Like there's the skill set was there, the confidence was there, but there's also a point in time where you literally just have to like, you have to implement, you have to talk to somebody you don't feel necessarily like, I'd rather just go I'd rather go back in my office and drink a protein shake instead of go out and floor and actually try and talk to that guy and figure out what's my way to actually build a relationship or whatever. And so that's the only other thing as well, too, is with every, I've never literally had someone, I, I shouldn't say that, like, I mean, now I'll get more people like reaching out to me, just like that'll literally just come my DM or somebody gave me their number and say, Hey, can I come train with you? So some of it, obviously you do things long enough, the same as any trainer that builds a clientele and builds referrals. Like after you do something for a long enough period of time, I am lucky that stuff does kind of get handed to me sometimes. But that most of the biggest things or the biggest people that I work with initially um, came from me having to actually implement, from me actually having to do something um, outside of my comfort zone um, to actually initiate and, and build a relationship. And honestly, that's the part that I think is missing now too. It's like having building relationships and and that kind of stuff is probably the most important thing any trainer can do in the industry. You know, for a million different factors, but especially for who you want to work with. You know, well, it's it's working with. I remember you said on one of the podcasts. You walk. You used to walk in the gym and say, "I want to train him, the biggest dude." And it's a case of most people go in the gym and try and find somebody that that might need their help. You would go in and say, "No, I want to train that person." You'd actually pinpoint, and it was a funny thing because in the early days for me, if there was someone that I, I knew I could improve, yeah. you'd want to go and work with that one because it would challenge you to it would challenge you, right? And I yeah. think that I think that this this is. This is this is a thing as well. Naturally, you know, a lot of coaches are online and they're working online, mm-hmm. and, and and credit to them for working online. Yeah. But you can't underestimate the connections you got to make and the people you got to go and see, mm-hmm. and and the and the results that you got to get because just because you've dropped some body fat with people doesn't necessarily yeah. present your skill. Yeah, you know, for you, you are demonstrating your skill with your videos and your content, and also you're going out on the field and you're training these people and, and showing mm-hmm. them tangibly what you can do, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, um, now from your let's get into the coaching side of stuff. Um, since we've last spoke, you know, I, I I still consume your content. I love your content. You know, I still am a meathead when I train, and I'm like, yeah. let me try this thing and let me try that thing because I see yeah. stuff that you're doing. What's changed in your approach to coaching and the way that you approach your coaching over? Because obviously, I, I know you now have been teaching with um, Tom Purvis, and that's brilliant to see. But over the last couple of years, what's changed the most, and what have you changed within your thought process? Yeah, um, man, I don't, I don't know. It's it's one of those things where again, I think it's it's a lot of stuff completely outside of the nuts and bolts honestly um as far as like you know it's not like oh i've had this big revolution on i gotta train this range of motion or i gotta change this you know amount of volume or i gotta train whatever that kind of stuff like there's some subtle stuff there that every once in a while make me go like hmm you know and make maybe make some small adjustments here or there um you know but i honestly when i you know i look at the nature of the industry and i look at the nature of information out there i honestly feel like a call to like try and depolarize stuff I mean, honestly, because I feel like it's it's just human nature. So again, it's nothing to even say about our industry, but that's just so easy, right? I mean, it's so much easier 
I mean, politics, that's why we have politics, why we have two parties or whatever, two parties that matter or whatever. I don't want to get into politics, but for, it's just so much easier for things like, hey, here's here and here's here. And let's just yell at each other. And that's that. And honestly, like so much of the stuff now, because that's the interesting thing, which is it's it is hilarious to me, to be honest, where, um, you know, you look about it 10 years ago. And honestly, to the best credit I can give probably is, you know, Ben, Ben Pikulski was probably really the person that started to bring more of like a science-based approach into the bodybuilding, into the mainstream bodybuilding world. And honestly, like, cause so there's a whole lot of, you know, issues, the idea of everything that Ben did, especially when he was bringing that stuff in initially, like people, people used to just like fight like tooth and nail, right. You'd have, everything was like, this is all, look at all, look at what we've been doing in the bodybuilding world. Everything was old school. Everything was look what we've been doing traditionally. And why even bother like changing that or whatever? And and honestly, I remember when I started to get into it more and started to present, maybe you should think, have some principles, have some concepts, you know, have some some things where you actually sort some things through some parameters and filters before you just blindly accept everything. You used to like all of my time was trying to explain why there's merit to that, right? You get meatheads that pop up and say, You're an idiot, blah, 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 Ryan Coleman, Dorian Yates. And I was like, You obviously didn't listen to anything Dorian Yates said, if you think that's a good example. Um, but so it's funny because it used to be a battle against the old school, which again, I, I felt well equipped to have those conversations because I'm like, I probably know more about the old school than you. Like, I love it. Like I joke at the beginning, I have a PhD in meathead and I'm actually still working with the current meatheads. Right. And so I'm like, I, I completely get all the arguments, all that rationale, the emotion, where it comes from, the nostalgia. Like I get it. Like, if you want to talk about how awesome Ronnie Coleman and Tom Platts are and Arnold is, let's talk about it. But now if we're going to have a conversation about how you're going to train people and how your people are going to pay you to train them, we have to have a different conversation. And so now I feel like because of the way information, this is the interesting thing, we'll look back at some point in time, or, you know, robots probably, you know, AI will be analyzing why humans did what we did at this point in time. But like, we'll look back and be like, you know, now it's, it's almost like coming full circle where you have people that take the same thing of like, here's this, here's the soundbite of this scientific principally thing. And they'll take it as just, this or that, like, oh, evidence-based is better now and evidence meaning PubMed studies or whatever. And they'll just now, it's almost like if you still try and talk about what actually has worked and works in the field and you might not have like a PubMed study, you can tag behind it. You know, I almost feel like it's now like I, if I present something like that, you're almost fighting the nerds now, which I joke, I use the nerds as a term of endearment. I consider myself a nerd. Um, so honestly, I, I feel like it's it, the same thing that I've kind of actually had more of a passion for in some ways. Like I, it sounds funny, but I think, and again, for the things that I know, which isn't as, I'm not saying I know more than a lot of people on a lot of things, but I really understand the mechanics of, of exercise pretty darn well. And I think it's because I know it's so well, I can still argue both sides of it, which I think we're lacking, right? I used to have, I don't remember when I used to have professors or people tell me that like, if you really are educated on subject matter, argue both sides, right? So don't just argue for why you think this is right, yeah, then yeah, argue yeah. the other side of it as well too. And that's the whole thing where it's like, yeah, it's much easier to say good, bad, right, wrong, but where everything actually exists is, is generally just some nuance in between there. And so I, I feel like now where there's some, there's some cool information out there and some decent stuff, but like without sounding bad, I haven't, I don't think I've had really any big changes in principles in a while. You know, I have, I have subtle shifts on focusing on, you know, there's merit towards you know, let's teach people like you look at somebody like the, this isn't a, this isn't quite adequately summing him up, but you look at someone like Jordan Peters, you know, and really being the person that's, you know, he's the logbook guy. If you just had to sum him up, obviously I know there's yeah, a lot yeah. more to Jordan, a lot more value there, but there's so much, there's so much value to that. And like that, that being your thing is such a good thing that the industry needs. And so, you know, there's times where I find myself shifting. I was like, okay, we really need this. Like we've gotten away from some of this. Some of this is too much, this fluffy, squeezy, feely, mind muscle connection thing. You know, there's merit to let's focus on why structure, tracking, you know, and, and consistency and adherence is, is king in bodybuilding. But then I'll have these shifts back at other times as well, too. It's like, well, sometimes people actually nail all that. And we do need to get back to this other type of thing where as well, too, where how you do those things as well, too, you know, can be a massive factor as well. And then we look at the nerd stuff, the science stuff, the what bodybuilders have done. So, you know, I feel like I have I have shifts in maybe where I'm putting more or less focus and try not to like, I'll find myself like, man, I just been putting a ton of content and effort out into like, you know, adherence and consistency and log booking. And maybe I should kind of shift back and focus on why this, you know, this mind muscle connection thing should be important or why this, what we've done before is important or why having this evidence-based whatever is important. So 
I find if I have anything now, it's basically just trying to have like, I kind of just shift around where I have focus maybe a little bit. I, I think really- that, that, that's, I think that's where I was heading with this. And the reason being yeah. is because one of the things I looked at and I was thinking about this heading into the conversation with you is there is this complexity aspect to coaching and then like a degree of overcomplication of yeah. this mechanics thing. Then there's the hardcore lifting side. Yeah. And there's that, there's that element where I know coaches are, if I don't know the deep biomechanics, I don't yeah. really have a place to be able to coach because without deep understanding of it, how can I actually train somebody in a gym? Yeah. Right. And then they kind of get this paralysis point where they're seeing all this deep science and they're like, I can't even take somebody through a leg press, a leg extension, because yeah. I don't know the mechanics well enough. And is there this degree of over complexity versus what level people? And I think that the question really is, what are the phases of execution that you bring in, whether you're training somebody beginner, intermediate through to an advanced that yeah. still still allows you to train someone? Yeah, yeah. Without yeah. having that over complication. Yeah. Honestly, like that, that probably like that sums up probably my favorite thing. If, if there's a skill set that I would like to say, like that's I could have hours and hours of conversations on, and what's the best way to actually, you know, teach that and discuss that. Like that's that's training, in my opinion, what yeah. you just said, and and that's a real skill set there. But the one thing I always try and tell people to maybe put them at ease as well too is like people have a this notion that an expert you know is somebody that knows everything and i always say that an expert is someone that just stays 100% within their knowledge base and is and is transparent about it and then you just relax you don't have cuz honestly i went through the same stuff like i'm sure you had to have the same experience the first time i heard paul quinn lecture like no joke i was probably de- depressed for like half a day afterwards at least half a day i was paralyzed i was and i was literally too like i literally first was like not just paralyzed with the amount of information but the way he could speak the way he could, the the amount of information he had in his brain memorized and also, uh, you know, had an understanding of could actually interpret. I literally was like, Oh, that's a trainer. And I was like, well, I'll never be a trainer. Like that's what I mean. I paralyzed. I was all exactly. I left. There's no way I'm going to be able to actually do anything in this industry because this guy's like here. Yeah, exactly. I was like, well, that's it. I need to figure out something else because I'm not going to be a good trainer. That's a good trainer. (laughs) And then, and so there's a couple of things too, where it's like, well, then I realized like I just had different things that I'm good at. And so I'll focus on those different things. But then also, if you really are in this long enough, you're going to get exposed to so much different stuff. You honestly have to, you have to pick something, right? That's the whole thing with trainers, the trainer that wants to be the jack of all trade and ends up being the master of none. I I mean, I've gone through that where I've gone through some corrective work or I've gone through Paul, obviously, because Paul Quinn anyone that went through that, you got to introduce this idea of this whole functional medicine type thing. You know, you're going to the further yeah. strength coach thing, but you go take biosignature, bioprint. And like, obviously this functional medicine thing, as the name medicine would indicate, like people get, you know, you get medical doctors that are qualified to teach that. So I'm taking this, uh, you know, weekend course for five or six days. And I'm like, oh, some of this stuff is great. And how can I do this? And how can I implement it? And when I would try to implement stuff, there'd be like all these levels where it's like, you realize Oh, there's a reason medical doctors exist. Like I have to have a really, if I want to answer questions, I have to be good at chemistry and biology and all this stuff. I really, I'm like, I'm going to have to go back and get a degree or something. And then I realized I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't need to be the expert of that kind of stuff. So I just need to say, Hey, here's where I'm fine implementing some of these things. I'm a hundred percent fine saying, here's where my knowledge base on these. And then if someone wants to take it any further, I'm like, go talk to that guy or go talk to this guy. Or if my knowledge base ends, I explain, here's where this ends. And I don't really understand past this because I'm not, I don't have a PhD in chemistry or medical doctor or whatever. So, you know, trainers just really need to, that's not an excuse to not continue to explore what areas of education might be your specialty. But that means like, you can't be, you can't be a functional medicine specialist. You can't be a a biomechanics expert. You can't be a corrective expert and actually be good at any of them. Like for me, I was like, I'm just going to be really good at training. What can I actually have people do on the floor? And that's my, that's my area of expertise. I'm not that great at corrective stuff. I'm not a functional medicine specialist person. I can't be a physio, whatever. Um, and so I was like, here's my one thing. And then if I put time and effort to be better in that, my education goes into that, that one thing. Um, so if I think if people just made, they're like, all right, I don't have to be like Joe. I don't have to be like Mark. I don't have to be like Paul Quinn. I don't have to be like whoever, you know, find what you're, you're good at and obviously put more time in getting better there. But if people like everyone's trying to like, that's the whole thing on social media now, because everybody's, you know, it's the experts aren't having any dialogue, right? They're having a monologue. You know, you can, you can take 47. I don't know how long some of these guys take to shoot. So I get people asking me all the time, like, oh, how do you do like such long videos? 
and you don't, you know, you don't do cuts and edits and all that. I was like, I, I actually know the material. It's not like it's something where I'm trying to like film something and have 47 different cuts to make a 60 second reel on TikTok, make it look like I know what I'm talking about. You know, so it's, you know, you get people, everyone I think is so concerned about being perceivably smart or perceivably an expert, but I've, I've seen it firsthand and I know it firsthand again, depending on your level of expertise, some of these experts, if they ever had a person in front of them will literally probably, you know, poop their pants, uh, regroup, have no idea what the, I've seen, what some of them try and do. And I'm just like, man, this is not just stay in your wheelhouse. If you want to be entertaining on TikTok and talk about creatine and stuff like that from this bird's eye view, neat, but don't talk about training people because what you said is like, how the hell do I actually take this knowledge and how do I actually train someone? And that's, and that is probably my favorite part of training. And even when I'm working now, like with, I still think about that constantly. What is the best way to implement something with Mr. and Ms. Olympia? Like literally, like how do I, how do I have those initial conversations? What is it that I'm actually, where do they actually want more value? Where can I maybe fill in the value? And then how do I balance this person obviously wants to get a workout, but at the same time, they already know how to work out and train hard compared to other people. So how do I actually give them some knowledge and some new things and kind of blend those things together? And, um, and that's awesome. Like that whole subject is probably, if there's something that I'm constantly working on improving more than anything, it's probably that. If, that, if that's where I put more time, more effort, more focus, more looking back retrospectively on a session that I had with somebody is like, how could I have done that better? Did I, did I hit that? Did I miss the mark? Was that a waste? Like the funny thing, the nice part is I'll have people all the time. I'll have like an off day, to be honest, whether I've got something going on or whatever, and I'll train someone. I'll be like, man, that was like garbage. I don't even know why they bothered to come train with me. And I'll have people like, that was the greatest experience of my entire life. And I was like, I don't, I don't feel like I said anything good, but okay. I'm glad you took something away from it. But, but that's probably that for me, that's the definition of a trainer is someone that can, you know, where the rubber meets the road. Can you actually take all this, all this great sounding stuff? And can you actually, how do you actually apply it to a human being? That's, that's awesome for me. That's probably my, my number one passion. And I think, I think going, going hand in hand with this, because it's a real subject that I want us to keep, keep going into because for me so long as i was helping somebody make progress or make them aware that there was progress to make yeah i felt i felt like i was being extremely valuable in yeah. today's today's world in especially in the online space which you know we're both very very busy in um if somebody can get somebody lean mm -hmm. and present the before and after yeah that seems to be the solution but yeah. when when we were on the gym floor and when we and with any coaching, can you get somebody to not only be lean, but here's the deal: if somebody was to do a before and after and say, "Look, this is what I'm well known for these before and afters," and we take yeah. that same client and we meet them for the first time in two years and yeah. we go into the gym, they've not improved in any form of exercise in the slightest. Yeah, yeah. They, they, and, and and this is this is the important thing to me in terms of adding value to people when it's coaching. So when you're looking at where from an exercise mechanics perspective, and this, this, this realm nowadays, it's like the, there's the educated trainers, then there's the trainers who don't care about their education. They care about what the, what the before and afters looks like. Yeah. So what are you looking for from an execution perspective to add value to somebody's training? Somebody, and we're going to go, I'm going to go straight in at the high level. We're not going to talk about yeah. gem pop right now. Okay. Somebody, somebody comes in to see you, like Flex or Dana, and, and these are people that train because you get somebody that reaches out to an online coach that looks like they're trained to have a bit of muscle or a PT. What yeah. are you going for straight away? What, what's your what's your thought process to identify where there's an imbalance, weakness, structural something, and yeah. then start to move into progression? You know, I, I honestly, with the thing that I try and the, it's funny because the things you should do with general population are the things there were times I found myself skipping with that population as well, really? too, which is I, I honestly always I forget sometimes because I would I would have I would have people coming to me for the same thing. Right. So most of the people would come to me for how they, they wanted to improve the how. Right. You know, I would never come and like give them like, hey, here's the secret workout. You know, Joe's going to do his program. I, they come and see me. I write something on paper. I'm like, see you later. You know, so I would have most people, they would understand it was about the how, but I would still make the mistake sometimes, even if it was nine out of 10 people were coming for that, I'd miss sometimes with one out of 10 asking like, well, wh what do you think you need to improve on? And, and where do you think that I can help with that? And, um, you know, so kind of have their own appraisal and obviously have basically, you know, an intake, what have you been doing? What are you doing? I've observed some of this with some people sometimes, um, because I honestly find at the high level, it, it can be two things. It can be, um, 
you have people that they hit their genetic ceiling the same as the normal people. And so sometimes it's not people seeing how much everything comes to a point of diminishing returns. So it actually could be some on paper stuff, like meaning they were literally doing they've never written down a workout in their entire life. You know, I mean, I can improve how you do things for sure. And we will address that because everyone can get better there. But I've had some people where it's like, I always, I kind of almost look over how mani- meticulous you need to be with everything that's quantitative, everything on paper, because that came so easy for me, right? I, if I went to the gym and just did whatever, I would look exactly the same having done that. I had to do like everything would be, you know, if I was doing a competing, yeah, yeah. I, every single thing that went in or whatever. So there's times, even at the highest level, they don't, they don't realize that's there. Like there's opportunity here where you need to get meticulous to realize like you're right here. Like your opportunity for growth is this very small uptrend. You can still grow. You can still improve. But if you're not meticulous with even outside of the gym stuff, with what you're doing, having some sort of plan coming in, I can come and I can improve your form, your eff- exit effort, effort and execution. And that might have some, you know, new stimulus or whatever, but there's still other variables there. So even at the highest level, I found there's some people that you know, if you've never been on a plan before, you don't have any idea of progressive overload. You have no idea of how progressive overload is a combination of a whole lot of things and how that all moves towards a point of diminishing returns. You need to get your head wrapped around that concept, you know, before we're just going in and let's do some squeezy stuff and let's feel some stuff. Um, but with almost everybody else, if I, if I look at the sum of like the, in the gym, if I have an overall goal, which I've yet to find someone I couldn't improve is, you know, is how are they performing their, failure reps. Basically, if, if I look, I've never found someone that I couldn't at this day, I've never found anyone. I've never had, like, I've had some of the hardest training people in the world, but even for them, it's like, well, we can improve that form coming into these points. So some people it's right from none of their, none of their things were optimal. So I can actually look at, well, where do I need to either change positions, maybe change, I hate to use the word tempo, but change a tempo thing or change a control thing or whatever it is. And then the joke is at some point in time, we got to take that out for a ride, you know? So it's, again, I can spend time and effort getting these things the way I want it. And I'll take as much time and effort as it takes. But at that level, there's not a person I'm like, all right, well, now let's see what we can do with it. And again, I'm, that's not always, if I had somebody where it was like, hey, here's session one, and you're going to have this person for every single session for the next 16 weeks, I might not always do it like that. But if I have someone where it's only they're coming to train with me for three, four times, you know, we're going to, we're going to expose them to something that they're going to need to eventually have the skill set to do, which is really train hard, which is training to or whatever you want to call it to or pass failure, whatever with meticulous form. Um, so honestly, the thing from normal people to the high level where I think trainers feel rushed is they feel like we have to do all this entertaining bullshit, right? So for general population, I've been there where you've got trainers doing like Paul Quinn used to say is the circus shit, right? So you'd have them doing all this crazy stuff and whether it's visibly, you see stuff that looks crazy and entertaining or written on paper, like what's, you know, what's the most effective workout for like glutes or something, whatever, like you and I could probably say, here's these three exercises done. And be like, well, that's it. Three exercises. Yeah. And I, I only want to do one set of each. Wait, what the hell are you talking about? How could three exercises, one set of each be the best workout for glutes? It's like, well, because like, again, what's actually effective and what looks really entertaining are not always the same thing, you know? So I think trainers feel rushed because they feel pressure from the industry. Maybe they feel pressure from the client. That's not actually there that the need to entertain. And I always used to tell clients, like, if you think about, and this goes from the same from Mr. Olympia to Mrs. Jones. If you actually want to progress somebody, what should your ultimate goal be for them? And I said, for most trainers, and again, this is a gut check too, where do you have anything to offer? Most trainers, your goal should be able to get them to train like you, right? If you're the trainer. And I always used to simplify that with, if you really want to progress something like you said, I mean, you can have anybody, you know, Hey, guess what? We're going to, I'm going to use, uh, I'm good enough at psychology and I'm good enough to be motivating and encouraging for a short term that I can make you adhere to a thousand calorie a day deficit. And I'm going to get you in the gym and we're going to burn another 800 calories doing stupid shit. Are you going to be a lot lighter at the end of 12 weeks? Yes. But have you actually changed that person long-term? No. Like if I want my goal, I used to say with people in gym too, is my goal, especially, and aside from working with Mr. Olympia, the only thing more fun is to take a normal person and turn them into a badass, right? Like, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. Turn someone that doesn't really understand this training thing, you know, doesn't really get all of it and not only slowly change their physique, but have them get like, oh, like I get it. They see the whole big picture of this progressive thing and, and why, like, I look at the way that you do it. And now I look at the way that that normal person did it. And now I think about how I did it and I, I get it. Like that's, that's the difference. This is the skill set that we're moving and we're developing. And so I would set, tell someone like, think about if you got a, a new client coming in, or if I've got Mr. Olympia coming in, what's going to have more merit to that person, the coolest workout you can write down on paper or improving the way that they do, they do one exercise. One X, because again, how long has Mr. Olympia been squatting, right? I mean, how long have they been doing chest press? How long have they been doing whatever? Like I could put them through the crazy, I could, I mean, I, that's the joke too. 
I hate to be a jerk, but I'm, I'm very, I have some good concepts and principles and I'm also creative, which are two separate things. I could make some like, and I've thought about this as a YouTube series. I'm going to make the most entertaining hypertrophy workouts you can possibly have that is literally like crazy. Like, Oh my gosh, I would have never thought about this angle, that angle, blah, blah, whatever. Like I could put somebody through something that's the most entertaining shit that literally no one has ever seen, but that's not probably actually going to help them. Whereas if I change the way that someone's, if someone's been squatting this way, their entire competitive career. And I can clearly see this is probably why they have a huge ass and huge adductors, but their quads suck. And if I can spend a lot of time with them and relearn something where, oh my gosh, I actually feel my quads now. I've actually taken this feely thing and I've actually done some work with my quads. Now I've never actually felt my quads this much on a squat before. What, what amount of merit or value comes with that as opposed to the most entertaining thing. So where it meets is I always tell people is like, as a trainer, don't have a goal of this workout, have a goal of maybe like one or two exercises. If you get to more great and take as long as it takes, like that's the implementation for me is if I want to improve somebody's squat, I want to tell myself to relax because I used to feel pressure as a trainer. I would feel like if I only, how can I only do one exercise or two exercises for an hour? Like that would literally be it. I did two exercises this whole hour and you feel like, how could I possibly accomplish anything? You might have a client do one lower body movement, one upper body movement. And I might have them do, you know, one set of five to eight reps. We're going to work on one thing. Okay. We got that thing from looking like garbage to looking okay. And that's the other thing too, is trainers have to be patient. I would joke, you know, somebody walks by when you're on set number one. And they're like, you're going to let those 12 things go wrong. I'm like, chill out, come back in like 30 minutes. It'll be good. I promise. You know, so like the, the confidence yeah, and comfortable, yeah. like if I'm, if I'm going to do, if I'm going to fix somebody, don't also do the thing where it's like you watch somebody's form, they do 27 things wrong. Then you give them 27 cues and be like, go, it's like pick and choose. All right. Are they going to like break their spine? Let's like address that first. Are they going to like rupture, you know, a knee or who knows what or whatever. Let's fix that first. So the low hanging fruit and just be patient. I've literally had clients where I've probably done and at the high level, I've done some weird like stuff. I'll do like, you know, 12 sets of rear delts with somebody like that's not normal. Like I would never do that with Mrs. Jones, but I was like, we're literally going to, we're going to find something here. We're going to try some stuff here. We're going to experiment with some stuff here. And then I'll get to the point again, I wouldn't do this ever with Mrs. Jones. So we don't ever get to take it to a ride point with a normal person, but with like Mr. Olympia, it's like, okay, I've got things exactly how I want them now. That's what I'll tell them. Like I'm to a certain extent, I'm imposing my will with their feedback. I was like, and now you're going to keep this shit together. Well, I'm, we're going to, we're going to take this to a place that you don't want to go. And you've never actually been before. And that is how am I going to take this to failure safely, appropriately, and give them an experience they literally haven't had before. Right. Cause even at the highest level, if this form is all new and some of them, I find I'll have somebody, Mr. Limpy, that the, the form might be completely new and they might never have actually trained a failure before, at least not my definition of failure. And so I can give them this experience. Cause if I only get three sessions with Dana, whoever it is, it's, it's, again, it's not the same stuff. I want to expose them to the idea of we can do things arguably more effectively, if nothing else different. And let's see how this feels and try it and base it on their feedback. But also I want to, I want to train you hard because every, every Mr. Olympia can appreciate, I don't care who you are or what you think of their training. All of them can appreciate hard training and they need that. They know they need that. And so when they can get exposed to a different type of hard training, and that's the beautiful part about bodybuilders is uh, compared to Mr. Jones or whatever, they're so internal already like they they have way better feedback than any study could ever give me internal feedback of like oh my they'll know like oh my god that's how that's supposed to feel like they will instantly know i've been doing this for 20 years this is what i am looking for i'm looking for something that was good orthopedically absolutely destroyed my muscles and took me physically mentally emotionally to the place where like they survived but appropriately and um yeah that's what i'm thinking with with those with those people from you know mrs jones to the high level is how do how do you get them doing stuff the way like like you? Because that's the difference at every single level. It's how they're doing things again, not not the what they're doing. You know, what are you looking for in a rep? Mm -hmm. I mean, like if if so, if somebody was in the gym and you got a trainer, like here's the thing: there's a lot of online coaches that are watching WhatsApp videos that their clients are sending them with yeah. no bloody clue what they're looking for. Sure. for. You yeah. got personal trainers in the gym. I mean, look. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, the gym I train at at the moment, more of a commercial gym as well. And, and I watch the trainers and they can't, they can't, we always talk about the coaching eye, right, Joe? Like mm -hmm. you, you just can't see it. Yeah. I know there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. But if you could give your kind of like five, top five, top 10, whatever, let's say five things to look for in a rep where yeah. you could add value to for Mrs. Sure. Jones and a higher level athlete, what would mm -hmm. they be? I think honestly, the most brilliant thing, which I'll give a thousand percent credit to with if, if no, no one else takes anything for this is pause this and replay this because this sums up 
a brilliant, brilliant trainer, but it just requires some thought is, is Tom Purvis's RTS principle, which I would say is the core of RTS is what does someone have? What do they own? And then to a degree, what do they tolerate? And so again, that that's trademarked. I think Tom's got a trademark after that. <laughs> zero, zero credit for that. But what does a client have? What do they own? And what do they tolerate? And if you honestly get that, you will be legitimately in the top 1% of, of every trainer in the world, because then you're not just copying stuff. You're not just doing cookie cutter. Here's, oh, this person's got this. Here's the program for that or whatever. You know, you're really actually taking the individual, looking at the individual and addressing what they have. And so what that looks like practically, so someone says, what did they have? What do they own? What do they tolerate? So let's say we've got Mrs. Jones, you know, and you, if you're giving feedback, where is their low hanging fruit? I would say one, at least have an idea. If you're prescribing an exercise, what are you prescribing it for? Like, meaning obviously this notion of a body part, but also even think about, and this stuff shouldn't be too biomechanically complicated, what body part, but then also what range of motion specifically. And if you, and if you kind of start with that, you can determine what does a client have and, and what are we training? So, so for me, taking a squat as an example, you know, if you're giving someone a squat, you're giving someone a squat online. If someone's trying to change their physique, you just can't write squat on paper, right? I mean, for me, at least have the idea, is it more for hip stuff? Is it more for quad stuff? And then also if somebody's squatting, what are they doing a squat for? They're doing a squat for the bottom, right? You're not doing a squat for the top. No one's ever looked at their clients. Oh man, they're messing up the top of their squat, right? I mean, if somebody messes up bad form on a squat, 99% of the time, it's going to be at the bottom of a squat. So if you kind of start with that idea of like, okay, am I helping people? Am I putting them in positions where they're more likely to use the muscle we're trying to use? So again, if they're looking at someone's squat, you're training online, you're looking at a normal person, you know, you're trying to help Mrs. Jones get a nice butt and her squat looks like this straight downy type thing. Knees go forward, spine rounds, pelvis goes under, you know, heels come up. Then it's like, okay, well, goal number one is how do we get her this notion of not up and down, but maybe a hip back thing, maybe more of a foldy thing than an uppy downy type thing. Or then you see what somebody is like, okay, they're going down. And at some point in time, you have this big shift or you have that pelvis go under, or you have the spine round or whatever. At some point in time when you're going down, again, things always start okay. And then things start to go bad. You know, so if you understand going back to the Thomas, Tom Purvis thing, most people waste time trying to fix stuff, especially if you're online. So if you have a client where it's like, man, the bottom of their squat, they're having this butt wing thing. I got to fix that. The bottom of their squat, they're doing the shift thing. I got to fix that. I got an idea. Instead of trying to fix that, have them do their squats, you know, two inches higher. I know that sounds like blasphemy because the deeper, the better, always the more range of motion, better, but they have something going on where their body is compensating at that point in time. And it may be something that you can fix or someone else can fix, or it might not. But if they can keep everything looking pretty right before that point, that's really kind of the, what does somebody have? All right. So if you have an idea of where an ex exercise should look, if someone's been going to bench press, and they're going down at some point in time, this happens. Everyone's like, oh, and what does everybody say? Well, I know for sure he's got an overactive trap. So we have to make that less active. You know, he can't do scapular depression. So if I get that scapular depression is working and blah, blah, all this crap, that's just a whole load of bullshit. That's all bullshit. Then instead of doing this, instead of, okay, for right now, if he can go pretty good here and it's only this extra inch stuff starts to go here, just go with what they have. I mean, that's what happens. Assessments are bullshit. So if anybody's doing assessments and you're following this 12 step assessment from anybody, that somebody sold you, it's bullshit. Sorry, complete garbage. You're trying to make somebody fit into a box that somebody else made that probably isn't intended for them. Your assessment should be exercise. And most of the time, 99% of people watching this shouldn't try and fix anything. You should get good at saying, well, what does a client have? And then stay within that. And then there's this idea of ownership. So again, coming back to the Tom thing, what do they have? Stop messing around with range of motion. Now, again, you have to use a little common sense. There are some people that like, you know, they'll go down on a hack squat and you've probably have, they just stop at like, halfway down. And you're like, I don't think there could possibly be a joint that's like limiting at this point in time, but the limitation with a normal people, most people aren't getting good, like really good trainers realize the skill set they're missing is the ability to regress. Right. So the average 19 year old trainer that's being an online coach right now has themselves as personal experience. And right now, as they're watching this, their abs are glistening and their bicep veins are pumping and they're trying to have somebody do a squat. They're like, man, why can't Mrs. Jones do this? It could be the problem is that the bottom of the hack squat is too heavy for, right? You know, you and I have had, when you train enough 60, 70, 80, 90 year olds, you'd say, oh, well, this person's bottom of the squat is messed up. How do I fix the bottom of the squat? Or maybe they can't actually go to that range of motion. Maybe they just can't go to that range of motion with their body weight. And you actually, when you work with enough people, like, I, I mean, I've had that moment so many times, I literally work with clients in their nineties. And you're like, man, talk about having to think is like, all right, what am I messed up? Or I can have them hold on to something. I can have them do this. So you, sometimes you might have to go to levels of regression that you might not think about to say, okay, hey, they actually do have this range of motion. I just need to adjust load for them to get there. And then there's this idea of ownership. 
Whereas if you're programming with a client where they can get to the position, but they look like a baby gazelle trying to walk for the first time, I would say they don't own that, right? There's a skill set. The idea should be if someone wants to make an exercise look like they're in a machine when they're not in a machine, that's the goal, right? You know, so if I had somebody working online, I would first and foremost have them go with the, what they actually have. And then I would work on ownership there. So there is something to be said where if your form is so globally garbage, you shouldn't load anything. That's the tolerates the last part. The sequence is obviously for a very intentional reason. So if someone's ownership is crap, you're doing them a disservice if you start to load them because you feel like that's what we talk about. Everyone has to, you have to progressive overload. You have to logbook. You have to do that. All that's great, but progressive overload can be gaining ownership. If you gain ownership, you will actually have, I would argue, more intramuscular force going to the muscle, which is the whole point of progressive overload. So, and then from there is tolerance. Tolerance is all the number stuff where it's like, okay, once somebody's there, can they have this? Can they own this? And can they do it now with 10 pounds? Next week, can they do it with 20 pounds? Oh, I gave them 30 pounds and they came back and they felt like they were hit like a truck and their knee hurt. Oop, we've exceeded tolerance. Let's back that off. And then you can play that game even to the highest level of, I don't, I, the tolerance answer is the most individual and the hardest thing to figure out, right? Of like, that's where we go for pro bodybuilders, high volume, low volume, all the way to failure, not past failure. That's maybe where resistance profiles become more important. Um, but if trainers actually marinated on that and didn't feel like you have to do things where again, like a full depth squat, like that, the, the, the concept that's being conveyed there is a good idea, except when you're working with an individual and it turns out it's not a good idea. Right. You know, so it's, it's all that stuff where if, if trainers online trainers working in person, take their time, work on those things. And so again, if I'm working with Mrs. Jones and I'm trying to get their squat, I'm going to spend maybe one, two, three sets, figuring out what is their range of motion, ma making sure loads, not a factor. Okay. I've got the range of motion. Then I'm going to work on ownership. And that might be some little different positions here and there. And then from there, it's the first session might not even be tolerate, right? You know, that's the biggest thing as trainers do is like, if you want to have a client never return is have it after their first day that they have a leg day with you. They can't sit on the toilet without pain for like a week. They're never coming back, right? If you tell them ahead of time, I'm intentionally trying not to make you sore. You're probably still going to be sore, but I'm trying not to because we can slowly build that tolerance up. There's a lot more value there. So how it looks like implemented on paper is it might take 10 sets for me to get somebody to a good looking squat with what they have, what they own, and then what they can tolerate for that day. And, uh, and I used to say, if it takes me, it takes me 10 sets to do that with somebody, which again, I don't want them fatigued. You know, if I'm trying to learn something, there's not a fatigue component. There's not a pain component when we're doing that. That's how it can end up on the first day of the client. You know, they only do two exercises, but at the end of the day one, they've got a perfect squat for what they have. They've got a perfect press for what they have. They have that forever, obviously, if they have any effort into retention. And then the next time they come in, you can probably do three exercises and then four exercises and then five exercises. And a client that can actually do after, you know, one or two, three weeks or whatever, one or two or three sessions or whatever, they actually have this base program where they actually do everything properly. Like that's the whole thing too. They're starting to get that notion of I can turn this person to a badass. So over time, range of motion might improve, form's going to improve, ownership improves, and then what they tolerate can improve. And that's how at the end of you work with somebody for a few months, you can turn the normal person into someone that trains like a robot, like that's, that's the goal. That's a good trainer. If you can take a normal person into a robot client that gets the whole thing, you're an amazing trainer. You have my respect. Um, but it's, you know, everything from the outside, especially now is like, how do you do that on TikTok? Right. I'm like, Oh, I got to train clients. I got to pick up clients. Everything I just said couldn't, you know, every single 99% of people watching TikTok glaze over four seconds through and swipe to the next thing. Right. But that's the, that's the fun part of training in my opinion. The, the, I'm going to, wind back a second because you said something that's really really powerful and it took me right back to my coaching and training progressive overload this idea that progressive overload is just weight and this progressive overload idea that it is just an increased rep but then you talked about owning mm -hmm. and if somebody owns better today than yesterday it's yeah. progressive overload oh yeah yeah for sure and i'd love us to stop on that for a second because i used to say to people if you do eight reps on the hat squat and you manage to go halfway down and were icky, and then the next session we got three quarters of the way down mm. and, and it was a better rep, mm. it was logged down. It was an improvement. Oh, and, for sure. And, the, and, the, and, and, and secondly to this, which I think is, is very, very hard for a lot of the online coaches nowadays, is the only valid validity to staying with somebody nowadays is whether they've lost weight and they look a bit leaner. Yeah. But in the gym environment, mm -hmm. if somebody's having you articulate what you just said in terms of what they can own, what they can tolerate, what their, what their range is, 
then the reality of that, the value that you're bringing to somebody is insane because yeah. they've then got so many different things that they can get their teeth stuck into and gone, now I like this training thing mm-hmm. because it's more interesting. And I had a question for you right at the beginning of the podcast, which I can jump back to, which I can jump forward to now, which was a lot of trainers get very disillusioned with the industry because mm-hmm. they just get bored with just helping somebody lose body fat. And it's like, yeah. Dude, this is this. There's so much more to training, and this is why uh, yeah. you're this is why you're doing this so many years later, and which is why I still look forward to my training sessions, Joe, every single day at the age of forty. Yeah, for sure. And I want to go just go back to that question that I had: is that progressive overload is more than just the rep and the weight? And I'd like you to articulate it in your, you know, in your way about the value the the value of just improvement being a value of, of progressive overload. Yeah, for sure. You know, and honestly, this is, it's funny to me. It's again, things just always go full circle because there's, there's, you know, there's issues with both extremes of that, right? You know, there's people that focus too much, especially if it's a completely intangible thing about this mind muscle connection thing, right? Because there's people that will just, the nature of our industry, just completely take a dump on it. There's no value to that, whatever. And I was like, I can tell you have not trained a person ever. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard to say. There's no value to that. But there are people that all they focus on is like, how hard can I squeeze? And I used to make a joke about this is like, there's the squeezy scale. You can't be like, oh, today was a nine. Tomorrow's going to be a 9.1 and then a 9.2. Yeah. And so like, so there are issues with getting, and people blur the lines. People don't understand the difference of like, sometimes we're again, like you were saying too, especially when you look at things like range of motion. And especially if you have an understanding of where exercises are difficult and they have their most merit, that's not even like, that's not even qualitative stuff. Like a, a person might not be able to see it. I might not be able to write it on paper, but if I get someone to go to depth, obviously where they're capable of with a squat, like we're increasing moment arms, moment arms are numbers, they're measurable difference. We're increasing joint torque. And at the end of the day, like that's, I always tell people, you don't, a trainer should have a basic understanding of this. I've, I used to say, maybe you shouldn't, but at some point in time you should, but you have to have some idea of, of moment arms at the end of the day, like at least some general idea, because if, the, if you, if you're looking at like the logbook, all you're writing down are numbers you know, at, at, uh, that's literally half the equation. So we're using those numbers to create joint torque around the muscle, around the joints that muscles influence. That's all muscles do is they don't manage load. They manage joint torque. And I always say load is literally half the equation. Like it's, if you're looking at joint torque, it's moment arms time load. So if, if you're going to say that the, the log book is absolutely everything, it's king, it's the king of everything. And that only tracks half of what your muscles actually do. You at least have to have some awareness of that. And that's why, and, and then, and again, I think it shouldn't even be to the point where you can even like draw them or do the math. Who gives a shit about that? But have an awareness. And some trainers generally do of like, well, why is the bottom of a squat harder than the top? If it's even the, why is the bottom six inches harder than the top six inches? It's like, it's the same load traveling the same vertical distance. Why would the bottom be harder? The bottom's harder because of moment arms. And so if you understand that you have a general understanding of moment arms, but so some of it is even understanding where if I take someone to a place where they couldn't go or didn't want to go, that's a huge improvement because I'm not trying to increase the load. I'm actually trying to increase joint torque just from a number standpoint. And then I don't need a study to ever show me if someone is at, they technically get to that bottom of the position, but they balance in and out of there. Is that going to have the same effect as if someone pauses there? But then even some people, then they pause there, but they pause and they actually sink into where it's tissue on tissue. And then they bounce off that tissue and they go up again, right? Oh, it's a pause squat. I was like, yeah, you paused before you bounce. Good, good for you. It's still a pause bounce squat. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff like that where there's actually very quantitative stuff you can still look at as far as ranges of motion you're getting there. Are you actually, it's not, I hate the people take the time out of t- the time under tension thing or the tempo thing, I think out of context, but it's like just the common sense of like, are you using your muscles there? And if you're a trainer that just sees that, you don't have to know the equations and all that crap. But if you just see someone like you just kind of inherently know they're, they cheated themselves at the bottom of the squad, then you do whatever you got to do and you, you say and do whatever you have to do as a coach to make sure they're not cheating out of the bottom of squat and let them get it as well too. That's at the end of the day, there has to be ownership on the client. It's like, look, the whole point is that is the bottom there. If you're just going to go there and you did it, whatever it's like saying, like, like I don't know, there's a, probably a better analogy, but if like someone's going to visit another country as a tourist, is it just to say that there's like a person like running by the Eiffel tower, they took a picture. It's like, yeah, you were there. You took a picture, you documented it. logbook. Good job, Paris. But it's like, wouldn't you rather like actually go there for what you're going there for? Like, yeah, experience. And, and actually get the get the, the substance of being in there. Yeah, the, what's the value? I was like, I could I could have a scrapbook full of a million pictures in front of stuff. I technically went to this geographical location. I technically went to the bottom of my squat, this geographical location. But did you do what you came there for? And um, and so some of that stuff too is like where there's huge value. 
and just, and, and that's a good part. Most bodybuilders get it and, and normal people you have to work with a little bit more. This still, all of this training is still an internal thing. And I think it is most important when you start with a new client, this is where people get mixed up. Like I would never focus on a new client, Mrs. Jones, that's never really trained before. And like, say, we got to work on how, how well can you squeeze and contract your glutes, right? Like what a waste of time. If I'm just like, oh, uh, did you feel it? Do you have mind muscle connection? Do you whatever? No. In, in the beginning, I think positions are your biggest opportunity for improvement, right? With new people, you put them in the positions where their body has the best opportunity to work, but that doesn't discredit the fact that there's still like this ownership. The whole point is once you get that this exercise is not for completion, it's not A to B, it's not CrossFit, it's for training this internal effect of this muscle, then you want clients to get that long-term and say, okay, well, technically we were in these positions, but then also, you know, did you get what you wanted to get out of it? At some point in time, do you feel the muscle you're training? Did you actually just try and make that as hard as possible on yourself? And then again, balance it. So you don't go that again, over and where you literally haven't written a number improvement in a year of training and you're just trying to squeeze harder. No, I mean, at some point in time, progressive overload is this massively important thing, but there's a lot that goes into it in my opinion. And there is value too, even to this, this squeezy type thing. If you don't go quite overboard is literally, I'm trying to make it hard on myself. As long as you can still balance, I've eventually got to move some, some numbers, some direction at some point in time. Well, I, I think, you know, let's say you look at the phase of the period of the programming. We're going to get you in the machine. Let's look at the leg extension. If you have no ability to actually internalize the effort that you're creating with inside the muscle, for the yeah. next couple of weeks, we're going to go up from this squeezy one, two, three, four, five, six, six to 10. And yeah. that's going to be our progressive overload. For sure, then yeah. we're going to start adding some load. Now, you know, I've always said to people, you can start to move the weight quicker once you know how to use it properly. Oh, for sure. But then, yeah. you know, I'm 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 going to ask you this question before I kind of my last couple of questions was, what would you do? What is what is the approach when you've got somebody say doing seven seven plates on a hat squat, continually feeling on their knees, and says, "I'm just struggling to grow my quads." And the reality of the situation is, they probably couldn't execute three three plates properly. Yeah. What's your progression from there with a meathead? Yeah. I mean, I all honestly, it's like, it's the ego it's, gets in the way, right? Yeah. I mean, honestly, at some point in time, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, I guess, depending a little bit, cause I don't have to deal with this as much as I used to, to be honest. Uh, but at some point in time, I think it's the skill set. Uh, one of the most in skills, most important skill sets and truths of just human nature, but every yeah. trainer, like this is a pillar, a pillar that trainers need to understand is that people don't believe things that other people tell them. They only believe things they tell themselves. <laughs> and so that's, that's a pillar like that trainers, if you're ignoring the rest of what I've said, write that down. And that's why. So if you think about that, if you think about all this education, all these things you have to offer, is it really what you have to offer or is what you really have a client that actually buys into and how are they going to buy into it? Even if like, so some of that does come, if somebody comes ahead of time to me and says, this guy's the expert, he's the blah, blah. They've already basically told themselves, and they are still telling you that even though stuff comes out of my mouth and they listen, it's only because they've qualified it as I'm going to believe what this guy says. Whereas if you're working with the meathead, sometimes it's about asking them enough questions. Somebody comes to you and they say, oh, my knees hurt. Okay, got it. And I'm doing these seven plates act. Okay, got it. And then you say, all right, let's for the first set here, let's just put on a plate. You know, I don't, don't want to do that. I'm not doing seven plates, blah, blah. And I was like, why are you here again? And I'm like, so you're, what you're currently doing by your own admission has gone what to your knees? And honestly, there's times where it's like, you can do this completely politely and professionally, but you, I will ask them the same question. I will make them repeat it. I'm not going to be like patronizing, hopefully, but I'll be like, how do your knees feel from what you're currently doing? They feel bad. How's your quad development? Are you content with it? No. Okay. So are we going to do the same things again? Are you just going to come here and tell me what you want to do? Or are we willing to give this a try and see how that goes? Yeah. And um, you'll have some, and honestly, like the thing is the nice part is like the the, the ocean's big. There's plenty of fish out there, right? So if, if you have somebody, honestly, at this point in time, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't bother with somebody that really is going to let their own in between their ears be their limiting factor and not be in a place where they want to listen. But it's so easy to ask clients. And th that is a skill set that every, every single client, like every single trainer, like, and I, this is me a hundred percent, especially when I started is obviously I thought I knew a lot of stuff and I might've known more than the average trainer. But the, one of the biggest mistakes I had before clients were clients was talking too much. And um, if you should, if just as a general rule, when you're trying to pick up a client, whether it's from on floor or whether you're doing something online or it's from a sit down appointment or whatever it is, like they should be talking 80% of the time. And if you can't figure out how to make that happen, don't bother with anything else after that point, in my opinion. 
And how do you make someone talk for 80% of the time? You ask the right questions. And then again, that's why I was saying, if you go through someone's history, because you get the same thing, you get a 45 year old guy in front of you that obviously was Jack in college, right? He was going to talk about back in the college days and I was doing this and that. And when you're trying to educate him on something, he doesn't want to hear it because back in college, I did this and that, blah, blah. If you ask that guy enough questions, there's obviously a reason he's at the point where he's at right now. And all you have to do is ask the right questions for him to tell you why he's at the point that he's at now and realize, oh, wait, but you don't have to tell him, but he'll tell you, oh, I guess I'm not 18 anymore. And um, I'm not in a place where I was always fit and just continued being fit. I'm now at a place where I'm 50 pounds overweight. And also my knees hurt just tying my shoes or whatever. If you ask the right questions to any demographic you're working with, they'll tell you why they need you. Or if they just have a big enough ego where you can't get the right questions, then you move on to the next person or work on getting better questions. I love that. Very, very helpful. And I know the reason why I've asked you that question is because there's a lot of coaches who are becoming more knowledgeable and are trying to gain that level of respect to some degree with people in the gym. And it's just backing themselves. But you've just answered that right. It's the questions. We've got to put the mirror back in towards people and say, why are we having this conversation? Joe, business is growing. We were talking about your YouTube. We we're talking about hypertrophy coach, the networks mm -hmm. you're making, the, the, the business you've built. Um, the mastery podcast is not only mastery in business, it's mastery in coaching and 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 the people that I interview. Over the last few years with the growth of Hypertrophy Coach, what are some of the biggest business adjustments or lessons you've made? Because you've been, as you as said at the beginning of this podcast, a meathead. You are a meathead. You will always be a meathead. But you're yeah. also a very successful businessman now. And I know you always say, hey, look, you know, if you can put a few quid in the bank for the kids, I'm happy days with that. But yeah. it's a successful business. So what what have you picked up? What are, what are some of the biggest things that you would say, look, I'm going to pick two things that I've really picked up in the last couple of years that that would that's actually made the biggest impact, what would they be? Yeah. Um, I'd say, honestly, the uh, joke, not a joke, but a, a true, and then I'll give some actual tangible answers, hopefully, is, um, you know, I feel like I'm horrible at, at business in some ways um, because I have the, the tough thing that I have to balance is, like I told you in the beginning, is, is I love a lot of different parts of the industry. Like I love relating to the 16-year-old right now that's consuming all the information has way more testosterone than he does actually have wisdom. And uh, I can relate to that because I've been there. So I, I like, like from a business standpoint, like what's my demographic? My mistake is I would like that guy to be my demographic because I love it and I relate to it. And then also I would like my demographic to be high level bodybuilders because, you know, of all the reasons that we've explained. I also love developing trainers because I did that as a profession and got paid to do it. I was good at it. And with things that the way the industry is going and the things I've done, I also like doing that as well too. So like what's, what's business role? Like number one is like have as more as narrow of a demographic as you can. Right. I mean, yeah. honestly, it's like, I kind of just said, so honestly, I, I say that because, um, you know, if there's something I've tried to do a little bit more with the hypertrophy coach is I, I don't follow my advice grade all the time because I think you have to balance that stuff. And I always say, if there's another pillar that I have of training and working with clients is also of existence is managed expectations. Right. You know, and so some of that this, that's hugely missing now where people don't know how to have create context because they don't have any training experience. But now, too, when I'm working with someone at a high level, I would never tell them what they're doing is wrong or I would never tell them what I'm doing is right. I present things a lot more with let's try this, get their feedback and then work through hypotheticals. That's the other thing, too, is everyone's just so definitive now. Well, this range of motion is better. This length is better. This volume is better. And I was like, you have never trained a person if you honestly think you can make that definitive of a statement. You know, so I always now with people, too, I'll, I'll give them stuff. I'll say, here's what I think will happen with this, potentially happen with this, but it's yours now, you know, do with it what you will. And that's kind of me managing expectations as opposed to young Joe might've said, this will definitely do this. And I'm like, I can't really make that statement. So I say all that from a business standpoint is uh, one piece of advice, honestly, would be a very narrow demographic, but I, I manage my own expectations. Whereas like, I think I could, if I did some things, I could probably make a little bit more money. <laughs> But also, I just like to do what I like to do every day. So if I wake up a day and I feel like talking to that 16-year-old kid, I'm going to do some content based on him. If I feel like talking to a trainer that's been exactly where I've been, I'm going to talk to him. If now I feel like talking to an old guy that's me that wants to still be in shape, I feel like talking to him as well, too. So that's me managing expectations of, uh, you know, I, I do, like you said, I do want to make money. I want to, honestly, more than anything, I've you know, maybe that's a little bit of an ego or chip on my shoulder, but I want to have value that matches what I bring to the industry. <laughs> And so, I mean, some of that is wanting to, you know, have my worth, obviously, in my business reflect that. But then it's just balancing, obviously, what I still like to do every single day. So, you know, there's always, I think, uh, people in a, in a business standpoint are going to have to balance that as well, too. What makes me the most money? What's the best for business? But also then enjoy your days. Because I don't, enjoy, that's, my, yeah. 
yeah, that's my biggest thing is I don't want to wake up. And I've had that where I feel like I have to do this project. I have to do this thing. And there've been times when I'm like, I've never had a hard time doing content ever. And there've been times when I'm starting to do things and I was like, I'm like in a bad mood right now. And I'm like, not excited about it. And I was like, why would I, why would I do this? And not just because I have a hard time working through that because I know the content's going to be bad. Right. It's like half the stuff I think hopefully people can tell when I talk, I like what I talk about. And so some of that again is finding that balance. Um, but the, the other advice that I would tell people too, is let your, let your audience determine your product. Um, and that's the thing I think I've continually, um, I've, I've probably, the, if I've made big leaps in my business over the last three or four years is uh, making developments in the next things based entirely on my audience. And then ultimately on my, my paying clients that I already have as well too, right? Where too much of my stuff, again, was the same 20 year old Joe thing. What do I think is awesome? And this is what I'm going to do. And so that'll help people too, I think, get to the point where, are you actually ready to have a business or an online business or have a product? Like, what is your product? Like, if you're sitting around having to think about what should my product be, in my opinion, you're not ready if you're using this social media thing. If you're using this social media thing, your first thing should be put out free content, put out your expertise, establish your expertise, give, 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 and then find what people ask for more of, right? And whatever they ask for more of, that should be the place to start, I think, with your, your product, right? You know, do people like these things that actually lend themselves to a one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship? Or do people like to listen to you ramble for 60 minutes about stuff? They want longer stuff or whatever it is, or they like you breaking down into more of this education thing, or they like whatever it is. And I think that could determine, is it a one-on-one -on -one coaching thing? Is it an educational platform? Is my thing, and not even specific just to, you know, what do your clients want, like weight loss, muscle building, things like that. But there'll be clues to what you want. Cause I have a lot of people, I'm sure you've seen people try and start this thing. And I'll try to give some people advice that I think they already have <laughs> their mind made up. They're like, I'm going to do an ebook. And like, I'm like, I haven't seen them in the space doing anything or whatever. And I'm all, I'll ask it like, are people asking for an ebook? And they'll be like, Oh, and they don't even know what I mean when I'm saying, are they asking for an ebook? And I was like, if people aren't asking for it now for free, like they want to know more and more about this subject matter, why are they going to pay for it? Um, so I would say people, you know, find what people are asking for. And then I think you're ready to have some sort of product. Cause that's how I started at first was just with a content website is people kept asking. They literally would ask me for longer videos. And I was like starting to kind of do YouTube. And then I literally had a client before my current, you know, business partner, Mark Fox, who does all my stuff with my app. Even before him, I had a client that was like, do a content site. People do that now. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. And like, just go on there and it's people pay, like get behind a paywall to listen to you, whatever, more specific content. And so I was like, all right. And so that's literally how I started the app. It was a website before it was an app. And, um, you know, I started it with what did people want? And that was what I based it off of. And then the mistakes I've made along the way were putting things on there without basing it 100% on what the members that were on there wanted or asking them what they wanted. So the big improvements that I've had in my business have come from being creating the opportunity to ask my existing members exact ask my existing clients what do you guys want more of what do you want to see improvements of what all that and all that progression coming from them let them determine it because the people that i already have is my my clients those are the people like the people just like them are the ones i want as my new clients as well too so if i'm building things based on them not only will it keep them happy which is the best thing you can do for your business is retention but also it'll get more people just like them which are already your clients and uh, and so i've helped with my app I've narrowed down my, you know, what that is more for, because it used to be kind of like a hodgepodge of everything. And now it's a lot more focused just on the training, not so much. It's not really anything anymore where it's for trainers or for whatever. It's more for people that are, you know, from more intermediate to advanced, you know, want to get big or want to keep getting big or want to maybe, and then obviously they realize there is an education component that comes with that as well too. And so that's where my business has kind of gone. And at some point in time, when time allows for me, I still am going to do, you know, like a trainer certification. Um, but it's really got to be in a spot where I can do that exactly the way that I want to do it. And mm -hmm. I'll also have time to do it as well, too, where it's, I'm, I'm to the point where I pretty much have it. Um, but again, it's, it's a time allocation as well for me, honestly, too. I, I, that's my biggest thing. Again, no one talks about, I don't know how anyone else is doing it, but you know, I won't, I won't take away from my kids are little now. I have the best age ever. And so I honestly allocate, try and allocate more time towards them than I do, you know, my business stuff. Cause I'm not, I'm not going to get this back and people always want to get huge. So some of that is just that personal stuff has made it a little bit hard for me to ever take that project to completion, but that'll just be like a completely separate thing. And you know, it'll happen when it's supposed to happen. I love that. And you know what you want, but Joe, last question for you. This is the mastery podcast. And you know, I've been 
on my journey. You've been on your journey for a long time. There's a lot of trainers on the way on their journey right now. You and I are still on ours. What does what does the word mastery mean to you? Yeah, man, that's a good question. Um, um, you know, I, I I don't know. I mean, I guess if I the first thing that comes to mind and and whatever that means, where I think it comes with my my definition of expertise, um, you know, which is is being being uh, honest and transparent with where your knowledge base is. Because like, I, honestly, this is something again, and, and Tom's definitely spoke about this, where it's like, if you actually, you, the same as he said with a, what does someone have and what are they own or what do they tolerate? You know, if, if you approach training like that, you only, you never actually have any mistakes. And that sounds almost like egotistical, but, it, but it's not. It, it's that that's, if you stay right within your knowledge base, no one can ever say you're wrong. No one can ever say you lied. If you really get good at saying, this is my area of expertise, and you work on the way that you communicate that, and kind of like I hit on the point too of, um, you know, how do you get someone to buy into that and adhere to that? And then how do you manage the expectations of that? So I guess it's those kind of three, if I had three kind of pillars okay. putting together, you know, is stay within your expertise. Um, how well do you actually get the buy-in for that? How well do you communicate that, get adherence for that? And then how well do you manage expectations of what the outcome could or could not be? And that's, and that's mastery, right? Cause again, that's the whole point is like, it's hopefully not for ego reasons, but if you always do that, then how could anyone ever say that you're not, you're not a mastering whatever you're doing. You're not an expert of what you're doing because you're never, because if you look at two as like, someone's like, well, why are you doing this thing? And you say, well, here's where I learned this, or here's what I've applied. And here's where I've actually seen, this is what I've seen with it. That's, that's, that's honest. And that's transparent. And so if somebody, cause that's the whole thing is not saying, well, if you present things that way and here's why I'm doing this and here's the potential outcome, then you're never going to have a client that says like, what the hell, why did this, why didn't I lose a billion pounds in six weeks or whatever? Well, then you're just displaying this before and after there's no real nuance. There's no real conversation. You can, you can fail then, right? You can actually seem like what you presented was going to happen. Didn't happen. You said, I can get you from here to here with no problems. And then someone has blood work issues or who knows what, whatever. Um, where I guess if, like I said, you kind of follow with those three things through, you know, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be an expert right where you're at. And that's, and that should be encouraging the trainers as well, too, is that whole thing coming back and not being Charles, not being me is there's always someone that knows less than you and wants someone that's going to genuinely, you know, honestly, they're going to relate to you more as well, too. Cause obviously that's a huge thing. We didn't talk about a whole lot is a lot of your demographic is just people that relate to you. Maybe you're similar to them or where they want to be or whatever it is. So it's like, mm. it's not even, everyone wants to, who's the smartest, who's the best, who's this. And someone literally asked me that between like, they're talking about another trainer that I know. And was like, well, which one's smarter, you or him? And I was like, I don't know how we would measure that. And I was like, I would never think about that in the first place anyway. Like who cares? Right. And, um, you know, so if you, even if you're a trainer and you're 22 and you're like, oh my gosh, there's all these experienced trainers that know all these big words and they do whatever. I mean, there's some 20 year old that needs help. There's some 18 year old that needs help. There's some 16 yeah. year old that needs help. You know, there's no, again, that's everybody feels like that's the whole, you know, that scarcity mindset when someone's doing well over here and I got to know as much as them, or I'm not going to get everybody that they're getting. It's like, no, there's plenty of people that have no idea what they're doing and you're the perfect person to help them. So you don't have to have this massive, you know, thing or whatever. So kind of a balancing of those things, I think would be, I love that's that. my answer. I love that. I'm sticking to it. Man, man, do you know what? Like you and I, we don't speak a lot when we do the they're so valuable and 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 i know the fact that we can come together and share this information pass it forward to help other trainers that are yeah. you know on their way through their journey right now joe i want to direct people to your stuff um mm -hmm. so they can learn how do people find you where's the best places to to learn about your learn from you yeah so um i always so probably instagram is my most active so if you want some free stuff go on instagram and that's where i'm the most consistent with um and so that's hypertrophy coach. This is my handle. And um, sadly, I'm on TikTok. So if you have a short attention span, uh, you can go over there as well, too. And, <laughs> uh, but also, I do have some pretty good, like uh, Mark was mentioning, I've, I actually have a pretty darn large amount of content on YouTube as well. So same thing if you just search hypertrophy coach, I've got a lot of stuff on there. At some point in time, that'll be my goal probably for next year. If I actually write it down, I'll follow through with it. But I've never actually made it a goal to really kick ass on that platform. Uh, but but there's a lot of free stuff on there as well too so those are good places that you can go you know dip your toes in see if there's some free stuff on there that you're interested in and again it's a little all over the place you'll see stuff sometimes that's for meatheads some stuff that's for trainers some stuff that's really deep some stuff that's you know just superficial whatever and um but then if you're further interested in more stuff i have an app and it's the same thing it's just you know you can obviously find that stuff through all my social media stuff 
and um, you know, hypertrophycoach.com. And the app is great now for anyone that just wants a spot to track their workouts, log their workouts, do their diet, do their, all the nuts and bolts all in one spot. And there's a ton of educational content on there. Like, honestly, I don't even market that anymore because most people, it's just overwhelming. Uh, but most people will go on because they want a better workout. You know, they want a logbook stuff. They want everything in one spot, which is great. That's the core of the, the app. Um, but then I'll get other people on there like, holy crap, I didn't know this video was on there. And that video was on there. And that video, there's hundreds of hours of videos on there as well, too. Getting way more depth in all this stuff, like trainer stuff, you know, nerd stuff, mechanic stuff, you know, my type of stuff. So if you really want to get deep, that's the place to get deep. Joe, it is always a pleasure to connect and talk and yeah, happy share. To be on, man. I'm very, very grateful as always. And guys, make sure you check Joe out, Hypertrophy Coach. Um, but Joe, thank you as always for your time. And, yeah, glad uh, to be on, man. I appreciate you.